Good evening and welcome to the September installment of VIMS's After Hours Lecture Series. Thank you for joining us. My name is Candace Vinson and I'm the Outreach and Events Coordinator at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. I'd like to take a moment to thank our donors for making this series and our other events possible. Thank you. Tonight, we have a guest speaker, Dr. Alan Poole, Associate of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Dr. Poole was editor of the Birds of North America Life History Series for 22 years. That series produced 18 volumes containing 18,000 pages. He lives along the West Point River estuary in southeastern Massachusetts and has been studying ospreys for over 35 years. He has written two books on the species. Fun facts about Dr. Poole. There are 100 pairs of ospreys within a couple miles of his home. All are nests which he helps to monitor. Dr. Poole spends his winters in Costa Rica and is writing a book on a resident bird of Costa Rica, the resplendent Quetzal. They are magnificent birds with absolutely lovely plumage and I personally cannot wait to hear more about them in his next upcoming book. Welcome Dr. Poole. Thank you. Thank you. Candace, great to be here. Wonderful to have so many people on board. I'm just, I'm just delighted. I'm only sorry that I wasn't able to make it down to Virginia to give this talk in person. We were hoping to do that. Anyway, here we are. And um, what I'm hoping to do tonight is um, walk you through a little bit of the ospreys uh, of the world. One of the fascinating things for me about ospreys is that they are truly a global species. And um, I'm sure many of you know about ospreys in Chesapeake Bay and elsewhere along the Atlantic coast, but the fun thing for me is to think about ospreys beyond our shores, and that's what I hope to lead you into tonight. I've got a brief presentation here, which I'm going to open up. Here we go. Um, one, of the, one of the best ways to start thinking about ospreys is to start with, with John James Audubon. Nobody knew ospreys better for his time Nobody loved them more and nobody brought them more alive than Audubon was able to do with his painting. Look at any bird paintings of ospreys before Audubon and they are pathetic by comparison. They are stick figures. They do not come alive the way Audubon was able to bring this bird carrying a weak fish alive. But one of the fun things for us is that um, even though Audubon knew a lot about ospreys, it's very easy for us to move beyond what Audubon knew in those days because um, the uh, information was fairly limited. We know a lot more about ospreys than Audubon did. And it's the global aspects of ospreys that um, we, we know a lot more about and also the migrations. Both of those we'll be talking about this evening. But let's start with some of the basics. Um, Ospreys, of course, are, are a hawk. They're a bird of prey, and they're a hawk that fishes. They're one of the few birds of prey that take live fish. They're the only bird of prey that lives exclusively on live fish. Bald eagles, of course, um, which you know well, those of you who live in the Chesapeake know well, I'm sure, um, also take fish, but they uh, take lots else besides, including carrion and uh, and lots of other aquatic, uh, aquatic animals. Uh, we think about uh, Ben Franklin, who when the US, um, uh, knew the newly formed government was trying to, the Constitutional Congress was trying to decide what was gonna be the national bird of America. Um, and everybody wanted the, uh, the bald eagle and Franklin um, just shook his head and said he didn't think that was a good idea because the bald eagle was a bird of low moral character, he said. Ospreys are not birds of low moral character. They do not eat carrion. They do not stoop for anything other than live fresh fish. Keep in mind that ospreys are highly adaptable. Even though they're living on a, on a, on a diet of just fish, they have managed to colonize an amazing array of aquatic water bodies. So they're both a fresh and a salt water bird. Ospreys that are nesting along the coast where I live here in Massachusetts and living exclusively on saltwater fish will leave here um, as they just have in early September and will fly down our coast and could be stopping at any number of places along the way to find their food. Um, they could be stopping at reservoirs in Kentucky. They could be stopping at coral reefs 
in the Bahamas or the uh, or Cuba, and then um, uh, in muddy estuary coasts along the shore of uh, of, Venez of Venezuela. So they're having to adapt to a lot of different kinds of habitat, both fresh and salt water. They're equally good in either one. The other thing about ospreys, of course, is that they build these huge nests, and those become the center of their lives during the, the nesting season, and it's a big investment. Um, the nest that you're seeing here happens to be in per, near Perth in Western Australia. Um, the number of sticks in here, I couldn't begin to count, but they're clearly in, well into the thousands. Keep in mind that each one of those sticks is a single trip by the male osprey. The male osprey collects most of the material for the nest. So you can begin to see that um, it's, a, um, it, it's not a trivial investment that these birds have made. And once they have it, they use it year after year, and it allows them to get a quick start on breeding when they come back, assuming they have a nest um, that, is still, that is still there when they get back. Bigger nests tend to last longer, and so that's why they put as much effort into it as they do. They're also worth fighting for. One of the few things that ospreys really go um, uh, to battle with each other about is, uh, is, is over nests. And you'll see this often early in the season when they're first coming back, they will be defending their nests or if they don't have a nest, they will be trying to drive off um, a, a bird from a, an established pair and see if they can get that nest. Amazingly quick to adapt to, to not only to different habitats, but to different kinds of nest sites. Here we, and we're going to talk more about this a little bit later on, but here you see um, one of the classic European nests, this one in Germany, uh, on high tension lines where um, the Germans have built um, particular uh, baskets that are attached to the top of these high tension lines. There's been a big effort to, to uh, adapt ospreys to these areas where potentially dangerous spots where they want to nest and they make safe nesting sites by putting them up above the wires. Some of that has been going on here in the U.S. as well, but um, we're challenged because we have so many more ospreys than the Europeans do that um, it can begin to get uh, a little confusing and difficult to accommodate them, all, all the ones that want to nest on power poles. Um, again, if, uh, if we need any sign that ospreys are uh, on the way back and, rec and recovering, um, look no farther than Kennedy Airport. Here you see a pair nesting on the ground at Kennedy with, uh, um, with the uh, um, nice uh, salt marshes at Jamaica Bay nearby, great feeding grounds so that they find uh, areas to nest near these feeding grounds and they aren't deterred at all by the industrial uh, um, level of noise and um, and disturbance that is going on here. You, you have a high you have a highly adaptable bird that can nest in a jet airport on the edges of the Atlantic coast. The other thing is it doesn't take much to get these birds um, settled in. Um, they don't require much to nest on. Historically, on the salt marshes along the east coast, ospreys would have nest nested on um, old trees that would have washed up on the on the, sh on the shoreline, they would have nested on, on hunks of peat that were ripped up by winter ice and thrown up onto the marsh, anything to get them above the water level. And so we have taken advantage of their willingness, their eagerness to nest on sites like this and built li little low platforms just using um, four by fours and, uh, and shipping pallets. Um, and they, um, this has allowed us to create um, significant concentrations of nesting ospreys on the salt marshes here, especially in southern New England, but in other parts of the coast as well. Long, I'm thinking of Long Island, uh, New York, uh, as another, another hot spot for these kinds of nests. Again, as long as it's above the, uh, above the, uh, the high water line, the, the birds are fine. The high tide line, the birds are fine. We now have um, over 100 pairs of ospreys nesting on platforms just like this. Some of them a bit taller. This is shorter than most, but they work just fine. Um, and it shows how you can um, pack ospreys into uh, 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 smaller areas and, uh, and pr provide great density and provide safe nesting sites in areas where they don't get disturbed. I don't need to show this photo to anybody who's uh, spent time in Chesapeake Bay. This happens actually to be um, a river in Oregon, but um, it could easily be 
Chesapeake Bay. Chesapeake Bay, by the way, we'll get back to in more detail in a while. Um, Chesapeake Bay holds 20% of the world's nesting ospreys. I think you're up to almost 10,000 nesting pairs. And uh, you have uh, as many uh, ospreys nesting in the Chesapeake Bay, more ospreys than in all of Europe. We've talked about ospreys as a global species. Here you get a look at some of the more specifics. Um, we have a um, three, four different subspecies of ospreys. One, a North American, which um, we know well, which migrates into, mostly into Northern and Central South America. You have a European uh, species, the Haliatus subspecies, um, which, is, uh, which extends all the way from Lapland in northern Scandinavia, through Scotland, parts of Central Europe where they're recovering, all through the boreal forests um, of Russia and into Japan and down into the Mediterranean and even as far south as um, into the Red and, and, the Arabians, and the Arabian Seas. And those birds winter mostly uh, in, uh, in Africa, particularly in West Africa along the coast, but also um, for the uh, far eastern birds in, uh, in Southeast Asia. And then you have a um, carrot two uh, non-migratory, both of those species, are, that subspecies are migratory, two non-migratory subspecies, a, a Christatus um, in, uh, in uh, the coast of Australia and um, in nearby uh, Borneo and New Guinea. And then the Ridgeway eye ospreys, which are in the Caribbean, fairly re restricted range there, mostly Cuba, a little bit of the Bahamas and the coast of the Yucatan and Belize. Quick history, many of you probably know this, but keep in mind ospreys were not always thriving as well as they are now. 1950s was the, was the low point for ospreys, particularly in the Eastern United States. Um, the main culprit was spraying for uh, forest pests for mosquitoes and salt marshes and for a variety of other agricultural uh, pests. Um, one of the people who was uh, quick to pick up on the, on the impacts of all this was Roger Torrey Peterson, um, the famed uh, bird guide author and, uh, and painter. Roger lived on the banks of the Connecticut River and Old Lyme had 200 pairs of ospreys on the marshes there, just to show you what these historical um, concentrations were like in those days on these, on these marshes in the right spots. You can see an osprey down below there on the left nesting on a nest on the marsh. That's some of the places that they were breeding, that they were uh, doing their nesting then. Roger noticed that um, for year after year, for several years, they were getting no young out of the nest. He sounded the alarm, had graduate students come in and start to do the work. This is the same time, of course, that the, the lid was coming off the can on, uh, on pesticide information and how uh, it was uh, affecting a lot of non-target species. Rachel Carson, of course, was the great voice in, in, um, in, in, uh, in sounding the alarm on, 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 on that. And, uh, her book, Silent Spring, probably did as much as anything to really, really uh, open, open people's eyes to what was uh, going on and to start to, to uh, um, create legislation to, uh, to start to rein in some of the worst of the pesticides, particularly DDT. Chesapeake Bay um, is um, one of the great, as I mentioned, has um, one of the great concentrations of ospreys and, um, and it, it has shown tremendous growth in numbers as have as has area as has areas in new england and all across north america all and uh, to that ex to another to that extent also in europe we'll talk more about that in a bit but if we look at growth uh, say in virginia ospreys um and this is a lot of this was work that was um done at uh, william and mary by brian watts and and his students you get to see um how um and going back to earlier days of Mitchell Bird, when he was doing a lot of the, the key work in, uh, in Chesapeake Bay on ospreys, you can see how the, the growth uh, really took off in, um, in uh, particularly in these Virginia study areas in the, in the 1990s. So it's the, really the last 20 or 30 years that has seen the very dramatic growth that has gone on uh, with Chesapeake Bay ospreys. In the case of Massachusetts ospreys, the ones I know best, our growth was uh, more during the 80s and uh, into the early 90s, and our, many of our populations have leveled off since then. 
Channel Marker Nest, we've talked about a bit, um, a big part of the story for Chesapeake Bay. Without those, you'd probably have far, far fewer ospreys. Clearly, the Coast Guards are being um, very good hosts, and the ospreys are trying to be good guests. I think most of the time they are. Occasionally, they obscure a marker, and the Coast Guard has to deal with them. But it's, um, it's a pretty good symbiotic relationship. The ospreys are doing very well on these markers, and um, we thank the Coast Guard for taking such a, um, um, such a, uh, uh, for being so, such kind guests, for kind uh, hosts. Interestingly, the lower salinity, the up, up, up river areas in Chesapeake Bay, the lower salinity, salinity areas have produced, have had much better reproduction and much faster growth in populations. Again, this is beautifully documented by Brian Watts and his students. That, that story is, uh, is, is truly his. And uh, for any of you who haven't read his papers, I encourage you to, to dig them out and take a look because they're a model of very good ecology and science. And they're some of the best papers on ospreys that are out there. So this is uh, some of the lower saline reaches of Chesapeake Bay. And here there's been some growth, but not, but not nearly as much. Finding fish seems to be uh, um, not a problem for uh, any ospreys in Chesapeake Bay, although the, fishes, the fish in the upper reaches of the bay and the fresher water reaches tend to be higher quality. They have um, um, greater nutrients. Again, Brian has shown this very nicely and uh, has linked that to the growth in uh, both, uh, both better reproduction, larger brood sizes, and, um, and faster growth in, the, in the lo those local upriver populations. So ospreys have a lot of great characteristics, um, but one of their best is that they are really good at finding fish. Um, and they can do it, as I've mentioned, in many different kinds of waters, many different habitats. Here you see a classic New England osprey pulling a, um, this is a bunker, a Menhaden. Um, Connecticut River, um, a great shot um, here, um, showing um, late summer when the bunker are, are massing and ospreys are migrating. It's the perfect combination. Ospreys are getting lots of food. They're fattening up for their trips. And um, there's so many bunker that um, it's, uh, it's literally fish in a barrel. The other thing that has made a big difference for our, our New England ospreys, and, um, and to a certain extent for years down there in the Chesapeake and elsewhere along the East Coast, has been the building of these nesting platforms. I showed you one of the lower ones, and here's a more typical one. These are often volunteer efforts, so there are lots of people who are um, who get involved. Um, it's good for them. It's good for the ospreys. It's great community building stuff, and um, and 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 we love it. As you can see, um, these often require repairs. So every year we're out uh, we're out working on them. Our hundred nests here in the Westport River, and there's a good group of people who who like to get involved and who make that happen. The other thing that's happened here that has been a a great fundraising opportunity is that Mass Audubon is in very involved with our platforms here, and they have an adopt a platform program. So for a hundred dollars, you you contribute to the Osprey Research Program here. You get to adopt that platform. You get all the information. You get pictures of the eggs and the young. So you sort of become part of the um, you become part of the Osprey family for a year. There are. Um, Ospreys have, uh, have colonized so many different nesting sites that they are beginning to be, actually not beginning, have been for years, um, a problem in some areas, particularly around um, high tension lines, uh, uh, electrical lines, and where they are um, nesting often on, on lights. They seem to love these big light arrays that are lighting up uh, ball fields and parking lots and things like that. Well, there was there were so many problems that there was a guy out on the uh, on the west coast that started a company, Osprey Solutions LLC. You know, ospreys are doing well when somebody <laughs> starts a company that's dealing with the issues that ospreys are bringing up. This guy has a full time job putting out osprey fires all over the country, creating designs and actually building some of the some of these uh, artificial platforms to get ospreys up away from these problem, these problem sites. So the, the long and the short of it is ospreys are, 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 are back in, uh, as I hardly need to tell, I'm sure all of you, ospreys are, are back with a vengeance. We've got more 
than we ever had historically. Here on the coast between New York City and Boston, which is sort of my home turf where I started my osprey studies, during the DDT era, we went from 1,000 uh, pairs of ospreys down to um, fewer than 90, a 90% 90 decline. We are now up well above 1,500 pairs in the same, in the same area. So you can see that the uh, resurgence has been a remarkable one, and it's due in large part to both uh, robust fish populations in the, in, for the most part, and to the, the osprey's ability to nest on so many of these different artificial platforms. But again, what I'd really like to do here is branch out from this, uh, from our local story, from our coastal story, and tell you um, a little bit about ospreys in other parts of the world. For research for my book, I was able to travel a little bit, and one of the places um, I went was to Finland. This is the kind of sign you would, you would come across along the road in Finland. And of course, as a North American, you just look at it and shake your head. But um, after a bit, you're out into osprey country and you start to feel very much at home. This is a, a typical nesting site for ospreys in the boreal forests around the globe. This happens to be Finland, but it could be Canada, it could be Russia, it could be Japan. Uh, many, many places where ospreys have adapted to um, nesting in these um, spruce and fir forests of the northern boreal range and um, are doing very well. They don't have the high density that they do here along our coast, but um, they have uh, vast areas to nest in and so their populations end up being fairly large. Finland has about 1,500 pairs, Sweden has about 3,500. And um, again, the story in Europe is a little bit the same as ours during the, during the DDT era, although um, it's different in, in other ways. The European populations were knocked back not so much by pesticides as by um, generations of, of hunting. Uh, birds of prey for, for years and years and during the 17 and 1800s were both feared and despised and they were shot. Ospreys were shot because they ate fish that people wanted, either because they were fish farmers or because they were wealthy landowners and they wanted to keep their trout streams intact. So they lost a lot of ospreys. Europe, uh, England um, lost 100% uh, of its ospreys. France lost most of them. Germany as, as well. So ospreys were down to a tiny remnant in Europe, except for the boreal forests of Sweden and Finland, where they weren't persecuted as much, where they weren't shot out. But the comeback has been dramatic, as dramatic there as it has been here. And part of the reason is because people have made a concerted effort in various parts of Europe to build um, nests for them and to encourage them to settle uh, in areas where they can be most successful, near, near lakes and, and rivers and other bodies of water. Here you can see what the, is it, it's a typical effort in Finland to attract ospreys to an area where um, this guy is, is living. They don't just build a platform, they build the entire nest and then they line the nest. So when the ospreys come back, everything is in place. They ha have no excuse not to settle down and settle down they do. Ospreys are doing extremely well here, although their growth has been slower than it has been in North America. Keep in mind that these are um, far northern latitudes. It's the land of the midnight sun. When I was there, this photo was taken at 10 o'clock at night. Ospreys can fish um, around the clock and that probably helps them, seems to help them produce um, large and robust broods there. Finnish ospreys are presided over by um, a, a great uh, ornithological legend in that part of the world, a wonderful man called Perti Sorla. And he has been the spearhead, the spark plug for getting ospreys back there and organizing groups of people to build the nests. Perti and, and every single um, young in, in, of 1,500 nests in, in Finland gets banded every year. And Perti is part of that. Here he is climbing a nest at age 77. And this is what Perti lives for in the summer, <laughs> catching ospreys and putting bands on them. He's a wonderful guy. I, I like to think that the success of the, of the fins all comes down to the, the, the sauna that was at Perti's little summer cottage up in osprey country in the center of Finland. And every evening we'd come home and there would be a, a nice hot uh, fire going in the sauna and we could 
um, get the kinks, kinks out of us after a day of climbing an osprey nest. Um, Finnish ospreys look just like ours. I wanted to make sure you had a picture of um, ospreys uh, hatching. This is a photo I took it up, up in one of those one of one of their nests. I was a low nest that was able to climb. Uh, you can see the egg in the middle is already starting to what we call pip. You can see the little hole in the nest where the chick is starting to break its it break its way out. The Finns have been great at um, publicizing all their efforts. They now have a fin an osprey center in Finland that's based around an old trout farm. The trout farm wasn't doing very well. The osprey folks moved in with a, um, a couple of foundation grants and took this over, created a sort of museum for the osprey efforts that are happening there in Finland, and um, filled up uh, a lot of their ponds with extra trout and then built these little huts that are along the edge of it so that photographers could come in from all over the world and they do they come when i was there there were photographers from from russia and from japan who were paying vast amounts of money to sit in those little huts and be able to get photographs like this because the pond out in front of them was full of trout ospreys were migrating through and it was a photographer's dream england and scotland and the uk has a great osprey story to tell um, as I mentioned, the ospreys were totally wiped out there, um, mostly by shooting and trapping. And um, gradually they started to recolonize starting in the 1950s. These were Scandinavian birds that first came in because the Scandinavian birds migrate through the UK, on, through Scotland on their way to and from Africa. And uh, a few of them started to settle in there. And this is a typical nest site there in, in the Scottish forest. They're mostly a forest bird there. Very, very different than our ospreys here. They are um, shy, retreating birds. They're quite, um, uh, they're quite easily disturbed. Most of the nest sites are kept, uh, are kept secret, kept hidden. Um, there's still some worry about egg collecting there in, 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 uh, in Scotland and England. But there's a robust effort to bring them back. Lots of uh, artificial nest building. and um, they have uh, now gone from zero nests in 1950. They're up to, I think, 250 or 300 nests now. So it's been slow growth, but it's been steady. This is the kind of estate that helps make ospreys possible because these old houses, this old land, most of them have huge holdings that include lakes and forests. And so the ospreys can be easily guarded. They can be protected. And these people are good, uh, have been very um, good benefactors of the ospreys in, in Scotland. It's sort of a turning of the table. They're no longer shooting them. They're, they are nurturing and taking care of them. Classic Scottish landscapes. These are actually locks. This is a saltwater finger of the, of the sea, of the North Sea that comes in, provide wonderful foraging for ospreys, although they also fish freshwater rivers and lakes as well. A lot of trout in that part of the world. Here again, we find an osprey center, a famous one, the Lock Garden Center in the middle of Scotland, in the, in the um, highlands of, of, of Scotland. Over one million visitors have come to see an osprey nest and to buy all sorts of osprey. <laughs> you can buy osprey playing cards and tea towels and plates, and it's very British. They have all those sorts of things and people love it. Um, so it shows the, the incredible appeal of this uh, osprey recovery in England and how people have welcomed it. Um, it's a very heartwarming story and it's been um, a very uh, great success there. Quick look at growth. Even by 1975, there were barely any nests in Scotland and we're now up to almost, almost over, actually now over 300. This is a guy that, it seems like in most of these places, there's one or two people that have been they're real spark plugs for making it happen. This is a wonderful guy, Roy Dennis, who um, has uh, led the charge on bringing off Scottish ospreys back and on um, helping England um, to the south get ospreys as well. And uh, also um, bringing ospreys back to parts of Europe. We'll get into that in a little bit, but um, he has been tremendous uh, for over 40 years, been a tremendous, um, um, leader in this whole in this whole effort. 
So England was much slower in getting ospreys. In fact, they had almost none up until the 1990s. And so they decided that they would try hacking projects. They would try reintroducing, bringing Scot uh, ospreys, young ospreys, fledglings from Scotland down to England and hacking them out, putting them in artificial nests and raising them there so that they would imprint on those areas and come back. Typical osprey nesting site in the south of England in one of these um, open fields, these big oaks and hedgerows. These are Scottish ospreys that are being brought down and were released there. Very successful program and a model for what's been done in other parts of Europe. And they built up, um, all of this was funded by a, a local reservoir, a water company. They had a big reservoir there, a chain of lakes, and, uh, and they were the people who helped uh, make this happen. And they also built a little nature center to go along with it, a very, a very charming one. It's a lovely place to visit. Uh, visit in a place called Rutland Water. If you're ever able to get to England, uh, you must go there. It's a tremendous place. And they've also <clears throat> done a lot of work on migration. Some of you are probably aware about uh, of the work with satellite transmitters here in the U.S., but there's been equal or or um, e even uh, more more effort there in Europe um, uh, to track ospreys in migration using these little backpack solar-powered transmitters that communicate to a satellite with the GPS data coordinates uh, sent down to a central computer where it can be accessed by scientists and, um, and, and by anyone actually. And so here we get, get to see um, a little bit of uh, the effort. This was, uh, these were Finnish birds that were tracked during migration. Um, and this happened, this was an interesting, um, the, to my knowledge, the only um, effort to, to um, put transmitters on a pair of ospreys, a mated pair. So we had both the male and the female. And you see a bunch of interesting things here that we'd kind of known about before, but hadn't really been able to, uh, to get precise information about. And that is um, males and females fly totally different routes and winter in totally different areas. Um, I think, let's see, the, uh, the blue is autumn migration and the red is spring migration. And they're taking roughly similar tracks fall and spring, but not entirely. To get across large water bodies like the Mediterranean Sea, you can see they're using islands, they're using land bridges. So they fly over land as much as they can, but when they have to cross water, they will do it. As my friend Rob Beauregard, who has tracked a lot of ospreys here in the, with satellite transmitters here in the US, has said this a map shows better than anything else that um, uh, one of the reasons that ospreys can stay mated for life, and many of them do, is because they take separate winter vacations. They also have a tough crossing once they get across the Mediterranean. Um, they face the Sahara Desert. And it's a four or five day trip across. <laughs> Needless to say, not a lot of fish out here. and. Um, um, but the ospreys do it routinely, as do, of course, millions of other European birds on their way to, on their way to Africa. This is a, a standard crossing for everything from uh, cuckoos to thrushes to orioles to uh, any number, uh, any number, warblers to any number of European birds. The good news, unlike the crossing the ocean, is that they can land, at, uh, at least ospreys can land at night, and so they're able to rest but they're doing it, they're fasting, they're doing it on fat and on body reserves, and um, it's an incredible journey, however you look at it. For us, of course, the, the major crossing for um, ospreys leaving, particularly the eastern U.S., um, is, the, um, is the Caribbean. So our ospreys, most of them will, will um, filter down, uh, they're doing it right now, filtering down the uh, Atlantic coast to Florida, working their way out into the Keys, and then crossing to Cuba, and from Cuba going east into uh, Hispaniola, and from there they jump off across the Caribbean uh, to Venezuela and, and Colombia. Very nice painting here by Julie Sikafus, which captures that over water crossing beautifully. Ospreys tend to fly low over the water. Um, they're not flying that high. Occasionally they'll find thermals out there, but almost never. So this is a powered flight. They're burning a lot of energy to do it. They got to be in good shape. If an osprey is going to die in migration, and a lot of them do, um, this is where they're most likely to die. 
Going back to Europe, uh, we find ospreys in West Africa along the coast of Gambia, um, Senegal, um, Mauritania, um, uh, these big wide open beaches, ospreys flock there in, in, um, in, in big numbers. And one of the things they have to worry about both on, <clears throat> on this side of the Atlantic and, um, and in Africa is um, one of their main hazards on the wintering grounds are, um, is what you see here, a fish farm. No osprey worth its salt is gonna fly over ponds like this, teeming with fish and not turn around for a second look, especially if they're hungry. Person who lives in that little shack very likely has a shotgun and uh, it's, um, uh, it's easy enough to shoot an osprey that is uh, circling over a pond or perched, or perched next to it. I think a recent estimate by US Fish and Wildlife Service that is in the US alone, at least 10,000 osprey um, from North America a year are being shot at uh, fish farms in various parts of Central and South America. So we're losing substantial, substantial numbers. Um, but um, if you look at the growth in our population, um, it clearly isn't making, uh, it isn't having some significant population effect um, uh, up, in this, up at this end of the equation. One of the neat things for me is about um, the Osprey uh, migrations is how they, how they link cultures. Here you see a, a school group in Senegal, West Africa. I think your mic might be covered, Dr. Poole. Excuse me? I think your microphone is covered. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Here. Here. Thank you. Um, no, I can hear you now. I think you were covering it with your hand. Okay. Thank you. So sorry, here. Yep. Um, the way, the, the way that osprey migration is able to link cultures, here you see a, a school group in Senegal in, in West Africa where English um, um, people from uh, Scotland and England have linked schools in the two countries in England and Senegal and they're using the osprey story to, um, as a shared common ground so they can talk to the students in Senegal about where ospreys are laying their eggs and where raising their young and in Senegal the students can talk about where they where they're finding ospreys spending spending the winter one of the great stories of european osprey recovery has been um the story of these um, of, of hacking of bringing ospreys particularly from scandinavia where there's so many of them bringing them down to places like spain which had almost eliminated its ospreys and again they're getting um uh, big numbers back there now these are the kind of hacking towers where the young are put before they can fly. They are fed artificially. They're fed cut up, cut up fish and, um, and then uh, they're released. And because they are, um, their, their GPS, call, let's call it their GPS is set during their post-fledging period. The area that they are imprinting on, the area they're gonna come back to is the area where they are released. So these programs have been very successful all through the US and particularly in, in Europe. Spain now has I think over 100 pairs of nesting ospreys, all pretty much um, driven from these ha hacking, hacking projects. Here's the fish being cut up for these, um, um, for these um, uh, young, young ospreys in the, in the hacking towers. And at the same time, they're building artificial nests to at least begin to get them um, ospreys um, when they come back, um, giving them a place to, a place to nest. So there we have it. Um, it's a kind of a whirlwind tour of the world's ospreys, but I hope I expanded your horizons a little bit by giving you a look at ospreys in other, part of the, or other parts of the world. For me, that's the great fascination of them. And I encourage you to, to go out and do a, little, um, do a little homework on ospreys in other parts of the world. Get to know ospreys in Japan and in, in Australia, in the Red Sea, fascinating ospreys uh, story in the Red Sea. My book covers some of this, so I, um, I can't leave without encouraging you to take a look at that. And um, as Candace has mentioned, if any of you want signed copies, I would be able to provide those um, to you. Just email me and we'll, we'll, set, we'll set it all up. Thank you all for being here. It's, um, it's a very different kind of lecture than I've given before. I hope this has worked for you. I think it's worked for me. Awesome. Great presentation, that was really informative. We have a lot of questions coming in already. So Good. let's just start from the top. Um, 
How far apart should the Osprey platforms be built? It depends on the area. There's no, there's no golden rule. There's no hard and fast. Um, it's good to probably to, in the beginning to space them out a little bit, but on our salt marshes here, we have ospreys steadily in on platforms that are as close as 30 and 40 feet apart. That's a little extreme. They do better at maybe 150 to 100 yards. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, the ospreys themselves will determine that because they will settle in before they have a nest on a site that they like that they think they want to build on. And at that point, they have already carved out the territory they need. In other words, they've made their peace with neighbors. And so if you see ospreys in that situation, and we see them all the time here, I'm sure you do in the Chesapeake as well, where they have settled into a tree or a dock or a duck blind or a buoy, um, once they're there, um, it, they're good to go. Um, and of course, if it's a dock, you're going to have to supply some place for them to nest probably. Or if you're going to build a nesting platform, um, if you see them out on a marsh, you build a platform that will often come, that will usually come to those. Awesome. Why did the number of ospreys taper off in New England after the 1980s? Um, Probably because, and it didn't, um, it didn't in all cases in all places, but um, the, uh, the, um, the area I was talking about was our area here in southern New England, uh, particularly in the Westport River estuary, and there was a question of them simply running out of nest sites, and so what happened when young birds came back, they weren't able to find a, a nest site easily and right away, and then they would disperse farther on. So while, for instance, while our population here in um, right, right on the Rhode Island, Massachusetts border was starting to level off in the 80s and in the 90s, Cape Cod, which is 30 miles to the east, was taking off and went from essentially a handful of pairs to over 300 pairs in the next 20 years. My guess is that a lot of those birds were birds that were fledged in nests um, here and on Martha's Vineyard where nest sites were beginning to become scarce, they were moving out to areas where there were more available nest sites. Okay. How do the ospreys survive going over the Sahara? How long do they store their food or fat? How, do, how long does that last for? Yeah, they can, um, they'll fly that in anywhere from three to five days. I think four is pretty, is pretty, pretty typical. So um, fat is a really important part of the osprey's migration strategy. They have to lay on quite a bit of um, uh, extra body weight, not as much as, as you know, the songbirds do, the passerine birds, which are laying on you know, 20 or 30% of their body mass in fat. Ospreys aren't that extreme, but they lay on quite a bit and they're able to burn that, burn that off in those, in, in, in those flights. And uh, so that's what, keeps, that's what keeps them going. And the neat thing about fat is when, you, when it's metabolized, it also produces one of the byproducts of metab fat metabolism is water. So it gives them just enough, it, it just gives them uh, just enough water to keep, uh, to keep going on that trip. A lot of them, we know for a fact because of satellite transmitters that some of them don't make it. So the Mediterranean is a fairly easy crossing, unlike the Caribbean, um, but the Sahara has a real challenge because um, it's such, a, it's such a long journey. Yeah, that's really cool. If an osprey that is part of a mated pair dies, will the other osprey find a new mate? You betcha. In, 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 a, in a New York minute, they're, they, they, they're not gonna mess, they're not gonna mess around, they're not gonna mess around as single, single birds. Occasionally it happens, but especially if the osprey is in possession, is, uh, has a nest, has a nest site. Um, that's a big attractant. So um, a, um, an osprey, either a male or a female uh, with a nest, um, is a, um, a very attractive prospect for a, single, for a single osprey. You get a mate and you get a nest site. <laughs> All right. So at the hacking sites, who teaches the juveniles to fish? Oh, um, juveniles don't need to be, uh, juveniles are not taught to fish. Um, neither by their parents nor by anybody else. They learn to fish on their own. And so the hacking towers are doing essentially what the parents do or the male parent, the female, as soon as the young can fly, the female parent leaves. 
and she leaves mostly to recoup body, body um, um, mass. She needs to get out there and get in food. She's been sharing food with the young. She's hungry, she's lost weight. She needs to re regain that weight for migration. But the male parent continues to deliver some food and the young begin to learn on their own. But what the, what the male does is he provides allowance. You know, he pr provides the extra fish when they aren't catching it. The same thing's happening at the hacking tower. They're giving those young enough food to keep going, but the young are gonna learn to fish on their own. Wow. Do the parents from one season come back to the same nest or is it the young from that season with its, with its mate? No, the, par the parents are the ones that come back to the nest. The young do not. The young, uh, first of all, they take two years to come, to come back and they don't necessarily come back to the exact area where they, where they fledged. They're more likely to come back to the general region. So um, if you do the statistics, um, on average, um, um, female ospreys wander more than males. They tend to go farther away from their natal site. So uh, females, I think these days, it's something like 40 to 50, 30 to 40 miles on average, which means that some of them are going much farther. There, you have some females that'll disperse 100 or more than 100 miles. You also have some that come right back to the same colony, the same area where they, where they fledge, but that's rare. Males, it's more likely, although um, they also could be 10 or 15 or 20 miles away. So building off that question, are the migratory patterns different for ospreys in their first years of life? Yes, and the book talks about this a little bit. Um, yes and no. Um, a lot of the young fly the same route that the adults do, but a lot of them, some of them don't. And it looks as though their GPS maybe is not quite as on track as the adults is, and they'll do a lot more wandering. Um, and there's some incredible stories. I encourage you again to look both at the book and at a wonderful website called Osprey Tracks, T-R-A-X, Osprey Tracks, which Rob Beauregard has put together. And there, there are details of osprey migrations for dozens and dozens of birds. And you'll see that some of them have done incredible wandering. The, just a, a quick aside, the, the birds that are the most phenomenal for me are some of the birds from here, from our south coast of Massachusetts, Martha's Vineyard. These are young birds that have never flown more than a mile or two from their nest. Oh, wow. One morning they take off in September and start migration. And these are birds, there were dozens of them that would fly that had um, sat, or at least a dozen that had satellite transmitters. So we knew, we knew their precise locations minute by minute, or at least hour by hour. These are birds that flew a thousand miles nonstop from Martha's Vineyard to the Bahamas, their first flight. Wow. And, and they were never at the end of their flight, they were no more than uh, maybe a dozen kilometers off a straight line, what they call the rum line, sailors call the rum line, a straight line flight between Massachusetts and the Bahamas. Oh, wow. So these are, um, uh, these are incredible stories. And then there are also stories of ospreys um, sort of essentially getting lost, an osprey flying from Massachusetts to Minnesota before it finally decided to migrate south. So there's some great stories out there. Osprey Track is a great place to take a look at those. So on migration, we have a few quick uh, questions about that. When the osprey migrate during the winter, do they still build big nests once they reach their destination or are the big nests only during the mating season? They nest only up here at these latitudes. They only nest once a year. And once they get to their wintering grounds, once they find a place they like on the wintering grounds, and as a young bird that can take three or four months, once they fi find a place they like, they're just as faithful to that wintering ground as they are to their nest. So they will go back to the same half square mile in the middle of the Amazon year after year after year. Oh, wow. So the next question is, why don't they winter in Florida and along the Gulf Coast? They do, but very few of them. And that's a great question and a tough one to answer. It's sort of an evolutionary question. The, 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 the short answer is that um, 
they do it because they can. They do it because flying to South America, although it sounds like a big deal to us, and some of them don't make it, most of them do, and it's not that big a deal. And there they find, um, um, if all of them stayed in Florida, it would be an osprey zoo all winter long in Florida. And they would be continually interfering with each other. They'd be, they'd be being chased. Every time they caught a fish, two ospreys would be chasing them. I'm exaggerating here, but these are the kinds of things that, uh, they're basically escaping competition. They're going to find their own, uh, their own little 40 acres, you know, but it's not 40 acres, but you get what I'm saying. They're getting to find their own little spot that they can carve out that's where the living is easy, there are lots of fish, and they don't have to worry about competition with other ospreys. Gotcha. Uh, how did the non-migrating species evolve? Did they come from the migrating species or the other way around? Why is it an advantage for some osprey species and not others? Yeah, that's a great, great question. We don't know for sure, but it looks as though the non-migratory spun off from migratory populations. It looks as though ospreys evolved in the northern reaches of North America and then migrated um, both um, across the Bering Strait and into Asia and Australia and Europe. And once they got to places like Australia or from Eastern North America into the, into the Caribbean, they were essentially in an area where they didn't, they didn't have to move. And so um, gradually they must have lost that migratory urge. We don't know, of course, we weren't there. We didn't see that kind of transition. But there's a really interesting um, uh, perspective on this. When you look at ospreys in Florida, there, most of the ospreys migrate. But there's a, hand, there's a bunch that don't, and those are the southernmost ospreys in Florida, along the Gulf Coast, along the Keys, and um, in the Everglades. But if you go 20 miles north of the Everglades, those ospreys migrate. So it shows you that um, there are particular areas where ospreys can count on finding food, where they don't have a lot of competition and where they can um, end up um, breeding uh, without, having to, without having to migrate. Whereas 30 miles away in freshwater areas versus salt, they have less chance of finding the fish they need during the winter. Interesting. And we have a question that kind of ties into that. What do you know about female, female ospreys, and that's their guests, in the Chesapeake Bay, particularly near the York River, hanging around late? Do they perhaps only migrate maybe to the Carolinas and come back and forth during the winter to check on their nesting sites? Ah, great question. Again, I don't know the specifics of that area, but I could I could venture a couple of guesses. Um, first of all, they, ospreys that you're seeing in that area later on in the fall are very likely not the Chesapeake ospreys. The Chesapeake ospreys have already moved on and the birds you're seeing there are very likely birds from farther north, Canada, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, Quebec. So they all look the same. Um, you know, unless you're, unless you're dealing with banded ospreys, in which case I stand corrected. I'm not saying that there aren't a few Ch Chesapeake ospreys that linger on late. I'm sure they can get away with it. There's lots of food there. But they seem to be really programmed for, um, for, mo for moving out. I mean, all of my Massachusetts ospreys are gone in the last, three, in the last two or three weeks. And I'm a fisherman. There are more fish, there are more fish here than, that, than at any time of year. So it's not lack of fish that's driving these ospreys out of here. It is um, simply because they are, um, their, their, their clock tells them it's time to get going. Good. Yeah, so we have a lot of comments and questions here. We still have a lot of questions, but we are sort of running out of time. Um, a lot of questions on how to build a nesting site and how long they live. Um, Okay, well, let me, let, me, let me go over some of that really, really quickly. Nesting site, there's a lot of really good online information. So I encourage you to go and, um, and, and, and look it up there. As far as longevity in ospreys goes, um, they, are, they have the potential to live um, 20 or more years. We have trapped ospreys on, banded ospreys on nests that were 
I think the oldest bird we trapped was 26, 26 years old. Um, but that's a really rare osprey. That would be like a, a running into a, um, a human, a friend of your grandmother's who was 102, you know. They exist, but they're really rare. Most of the ospreys, um, if you look at uh, a graph of the age in any one population, the graph would peak around eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. So you get, um, you get a lot, as far as breeders go. So the, 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 the vast majority of your breeding population would be in that, um, in that category of say seven to 11 years, seven to 12 years old. Then you, it starts to taper off. And of course, on the, on the early side with the younger ospreys, they're just getting started. So there aren't as many of them breeding. It can take them a while to get going on, on nesting. Anyway, I hope this has been helpful. I'm delighted to have had so many people. I see 110 participants. Is that true? That yes, we had incredible. 133 at one point. So yeah. very well, awesome. I am, I am, I am flattered. I'm honored to be here. Seeing the other speakers that are coming up, um, I feel like I'm in very good company, and um, uh, this has been wonderful. Thank you. I wanted to read you a couple of comments really fast before we leave. Um, yeah. Someone said that they were at Rutland Water uh, in England about five years ago, and everyone was excited about the Ospreys, especially after the Raptor Center. And we have another guest that said, enjoyed your presentation. Just finished your book last week, and it is a great overview of ospreys around the world, their habitats and migrations, and they recommend reading to everyone. So make sure you uh, contact Dr. Poole if you would like more information on how to order a signed or an inscribed copy. The holidays are coming up. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Poole, so much. And thanks, everyone, for joining. And again, thanks to all of our sponsors. And we will see you at our next After Hours. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night.